So here in Minneapolis, we are about to have, if the weather folks are right, a really big thunderstorm. So if by any chance um, I lose the connection, I will make an effort to get back on, but we are about to have um, a fairly significant storm, I think. So we'll um, begin as we always do with um, a half hour sit. And I will do some guiding and um, I would encourage you to find a posture that really supports you, that lets you feel like you're really present here and not something that you, um, not something that's contrived, but something that feels like genuinely, okay, you're here, you've arrived. All right. So the first thing I'd like you to do is just to take a minute to just recognize your intention for this sit and for this evening. And just really reflect on what your aspiration is for our time together. just having an intention is is helpful and the second thing is i would really encourage you to bring your whole self into this space not just the the good meditator not just the person who's interested in the topic, but really let your whole self be here. The parts that may be crabby or petty, fearful, the part maybe that thought, you know, I could watch TV tonight and that might be better. So invite that part in. So just let your whole self be here and really, really welcome that whole space, that whole self into the space. There's no part of us that isn't welcome. And then just for a moment, regard yourself as an organism on this planet. And just recognize that your participation is part of a whole, huge, vastly complex ecosystem. And also participation in a vast ethical ecosystem. So recognize your connectedness. and your contribution. And then finally, <coughs> take a moment to appreciate the support that we give to and get from each other in this practice. Even if you don't say anything all evening, 
everyone here benefits from your being here. So as we begin our mindfulness practice, let's remember that mindfulness is really being aware of the present moment's experience as best we can without judgment. It's being in the present moment, seeing clearly how things are, whether it's bodily sensations, emotions, thoughts, we're just here to recognize it, to recognize the present moment's experience, to take it in. And so often in our practice, we have this habit of really striving to accomplish something, to get something, even simply to get it right. There's this, this idea that practice has to be a certain way and we have to get it right. And I would just invite you for this evening to as best you can, let go of that, or at least loosen, loosen the grip that that may hold on you. And see what it's like if you practice with a receptive awareness, a kindly receptive awareness. The teacher in the Tibetan tradition, Willa Blythe Baker, often encourages yogis to let the body be like a mountain, solid and stable, but not, not a dead thing, living. And let the breath be like the ocean with the tides coming in and out and letting the mind be like sky, open and unchanged by whatever comes through it, not rejecting anything. So see if your practice tonight can be a practice in which you relax, you trust, you're open to awareness, and trusting your own, your own understanding of yourself. And if you find focusing on the breath supports your mindfulness, focus on the breath. If you find open awareness supports it, use open awareness. Have a kind of kindly curiosity to see what best supports this receptive open awareness to how things are right now, which of course is always changing. And we'll sit in silence now for a while.
it'll take a minute to uh, stretch. Um, stand up if you want, move around for a minute. Have a drink. Has everyone here heard about the 20-20-20 rule for Zoom? Every 20 minutes, you're supposed to look 20 feet away um, for 20 seconds is the sort of Zoom hygiene. <clears throat> so is there anyone who's here for the first time tonight? Would you unmute yourself and say hello if you're here for the first time? And tell us where you're coming from. So where as you, um, uh, Susan, what we've been doing um, this for the past couple of months is reading this book by Sharon Salzberg. This has sort of been the, the very uh, rough armature for the talks that Shelley's been giving. And the, the book is called Faith, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. And it's that subtitle that is really important about learning how to trust our own deepest experience. And we're up to the um, chapter on faith in action. And um, that's what I want to talk about tonight. And I actually have um, comments from four different authors, Buddhist authors, about faith in action. And um, when we talk about faith, um, Sharon makes the point that faith is really this idea of placing the heart upon. It is not entertaining a belief, but faith is about making a choice. And it's a choice to place our heart upon something, place our heart upon the Dharma, upon taking refuge in the Buddha taking refuge in, in Sangha, uh, trusting our own deepest experience. Another way we sometimes talk about faith that is analogous is about faith being um, confidence, that it's not uh, faith, when we have faith in something, we have a kind of confidence. And it's a confidence that comes, as Sharon says, from trusting our own deepest experience. <clears throat> and Shelley said something last week that I thought was so beautiful and um, and mysterious in, in a way. Shelley last week said, faith is a kind of action born of deep intimacy. Faith is a kind of action born of deep intimacy. And I think that is, um, almost aspirational um, and um, I hear the sirens going off and I'm sure someone in my household will tell me if I need to go to the basement so I'm staying upstairs for now so when we we trust our own deepest experience and we have uh, this sort of uh, confidence um, it's not a naive faith and it's not, um, faith doesn't absolve us of our responsibility. Faith is, um, as Shelley said, faith is a kind of action born of our uh, deep intimacy. So the first um, text I have, and this is a short one, this is by Sharon Salzberg, and it's from the book. And it, she, Sharon says, when someone's suffering, 
seems to have no end. When it is too much to bear, we can lose faith in our ability to make any difference at all. But it is exactly at these times when faith is most needed. How do we cultivate a faith that enables us to take positive action in the world against even overwhelming odds? Where can we place our faith that enables us to work to make a difference, especially when it seems like no matter what we do, it's not enough? And I think this is something that is probably familiar to uh, many of us, this idea that no matter what we do, it's not, it's not going to be enough. The odds are against us. Um, we're not going to, our little effort is not going to make any difference. And um, I think that's, that's something that we, you know, it's sort of a way in which we get a pass about being involved in in any way. Um, it's that sort of giving up. And one thing we can do is just to look at the exaggerated selfing in that. The exaggerated sense of power and, and responsibility. You know, if I can't if I can't make a significant difference, I'm not going to do, it, do anything. It's too big. You know, just sort of throwing up your hands and um, and not engaging. And I do think that this is uh, a real uh, temptation for um, for our culture generally, society generally. But I think too sometimes that. Um, Buddhists think I'm just going to retreat. I I will just I'll just practice. That's you know, the, the sort of, of turning your back on on the world. And you know there are many many things that we can't fix, but that doesn't mean that we can't make them better. You know if you think about um, grief, for example. Um, your own grief or someone else's. Someone has a, a terrible, terrible loss. And you know, there's nothing that you can do to change that. But you can, um, through your presence, through your compassion, through your kind attention, um, make a difference even if it's only a small difference. And we never know, I mean, that's the other part. We never know the magnitude of our, um, of our, our acts. And bearing witness is a form of compassionate action. Caring is an action. And when Sharon talked about in, in the book about uh, sort of being confronted by um, you know, this, this sort of sense of the enormity of things and how do I make a difference? Um, she really noted that there were sort of two things, that one thing is to kind of um, take the big picture to understand impermanence, to understand that everything is always changing, even if it's not obvious and to do a little balancing that when things seem overwhelmingly um, difficult, overwhelmingly bad, that there's just so much suffering to really bring your attention to looking at where there might be some joy, where there might be um, a place where there's not suffering. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh used to say something like, you know, look for the not toothache. Um, when you're when you're suffering, recognize that you know there's a lot of not toothache going on as well as the tooth that that aches, and we also know that you know from our our practice and our understanding of the um, 
the eightfold path that the initial step in that path is really wise understanding and wise understanding is always that there's cause and effect there are causes and conditions and when things seem overwhelming to us one of the things we can do is bring our attention to well what are what are the causes and conditions instead of just letting ourselves be engulfed by the um, enormity of something. And that leads me to this, uh, this longer uh, piece of text by um, a Dharma teacher named Pascal Eau Claire. And I don't know if anyone here is familiar with uh, Pascal. He teaches usually out of Spirit Rock. He is um, Canadian. Um, has a background in theater and dance. He's a gay man, and he's also HIV positive. And he talks a lot in his uh, teaching about um, sort of the shame of that and the secrecy of that early on in, in his life and the sense of, um, of dread uh, and, and how the Dharma has really changed um, coming into the Dharma has really changed his whole life. And um, so he's now um, a teacher and uh, a very, very interesting, interesting teacher. And this text comes from an interview with him um, that was published in the most recent issue of um, the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies um, online journal Insight. And Pascal says, when you see suffering, it hurts. It could be inside your own mind, how you treat yourself, or it could be in the way we treat each other. It's the same hurt. It's the same recognition of suffering. And in the same way, it's the same joy, the joy of liberation. There's no different joy. The immense joy of seeing that I don't have to believe my thoughts. This is so liberating and it brings so much joy. And when I see outside that there's a way that I can consider something I didn't consider before, and that would make a lot of difference to some of us in the group or in the society, there's that same joy of, wow, there's something here that can be stopped that will create safety. It can be in the inner world or the outer world. It doesn't make a difference. It's the same joy of creating a little more safety or a capacity to see what's going on. I think there are so many spiritual joys that come from this practice. There's a lot of joy to be found in this practice. And for me, there's something in the joy of renunciation. The joy of letting go of wanting things is one thing. But the joy of letting go of my carelessness about what's going on for others or the joy of losing some of my privilege is an amazing kind of joy. I don't have to shy away from this joy. This joy is nourishing. This joy is onward leading. Go toward this joy of participating in creating a safer space of more inclusion or at least creating less trouble. You know, creating trouble just by being unconscious. What's appearing for me in the last few years is that all the tools that I've been taught through Buddhist practice, they're perfectly made for decolonization or waking up to ableism or ageism or transphobia. That's why I also tend to say it's the same Dharma I recognize it in my heart and in my body, but also in the tools that I've been practicing for disentangling the tangle in my psyche are the same tools I can apply to social liberation. They directly apply. We're entering a conversation about racism. I really need to be calm here. I really need to be curious here. It's the same thing I've been taught when I was at IMS in the woods practicing. It's very delicate here. You have to pay close attention. 
be very curious, be able to be uncomfortable. You're going to learn something here. Tune in, use sati, investigation, all the factors, equanimity, not making things personal. You're going to learn about conditionality, what leads to suffering, what leads away from suffering. There's none of the Dharma that doesn't apply to this work of waking up as a society. I love that last line. There's none of the Dharma that doesn't apply to this work of waking up as a society. So both spiritual liberation and social liberation have the taste of the Dharma. And it's this joyful practice of waking up to our own racial and social biases. And um, at least for me, this is kind of a new way of thinking about it. It's been you know, waking up to my own biases has been in many ways um, a humbling and, and painful um, experience. But um, when Pascal talks about it as the joy of creating more safety, causing less harm, I mean, that's a wonderful, wonderful framing um, for it. Bringing mindfulness, investigation, equanimity, seeing the impersonality, you know, and ultimately what leads to suffering and what leads away from suffering. And this is, again, faith in action, where we take all these tools that we've, we've learned through our practice, our, our mindfulness, our equanimity practice, um, the factors of um, awakening, the Eightfold Path, all of these sorts of things. We can use those tools in our effort, as Pascal says, to make a safer place. And that's just a lovely aspiration for any Sangha that, you know, we're here supporting each other, getting support from each other. And, you know, what if our intention was to make this a safer place for each other, um, a more inclusive place for each other, a place where we all really felt the joy in, uh, in waking up to um, our own misunderstandings, our own limitations. So um, I, I just really take to heart, there's none of the Dharma that doesn't apply to the work of waking up as a society. And so we can bring these, these practices and these understandings, not only in our own sanghas, when we're here with people who share this, but we can also in very mindful and, and gentle ways, you know, bring this out in, in the world, our deep listening, our understanding of conditionality. You know, what leads to suffering when we're in these sorts of uh, heated debates to really have a curiosity about what leads to suffering and to have a real uh, sense of joy in our uh, exploration of that. The next bit of text I'd like to share with you is from Tanisara. And if you were here last year, you know that Shelley used the, the book Listening to the Heart by uh, Tanisara and Kitasaro. So this is the same Tanisara who is um, a fierce, fierce um, I'm, I'm trying to think what, what the exactly are. She is so fierce in her defense of our our beautiful planet, of our our complicated and uh, amazing Earth, and she is just so intent on uh, on really having us listen to our hearts and do whatever we can to alleviate the suffering for others that is coming in um, in our uh, 
in the warming of, of the planet. And some of you may, be, um, may have noted that you know, in the past few weeks, it's been you know, like 120 degrees in places in India and Pakistan. And you know, these sort of incredible um, heat events are, um, are just devastating. And if any of you read um, cli-fi climate fiction, and you've read the book, The Ministry of the Future, which was one of Barack Obama's um, favorite books, I think in 2018, um, it begins with an event, which is this um, amazing uh, heat wave that kills millions of people. It's like this, that it's just, you know, the body just can't can't exist when it's that hot, when you can't cool. When it's that hot, that humid, people just die. So, um, so Tanisara takes that very seriously. And she says, we must look directly at what is in front of us. The recent reports from the UN's governmental panel on climate change make it crystal clear we are on red alert and it's now or never. If we don't act in support of systemic change, we will not avoid climate hellscapes becoming the norm. That knowledge is a challenge to us all. We have to act, not just as individuals, but as a collective, which is a good thing. It means we have to think collectively and join the mass of people needed to tip the scales. Even though hope for the future hangs by fraying threads, there is enormous potential in our ability to organize as Dharma practitioners and as citizens. Amid a world on fire, we have the skills to balance between hope and nihilism. This is not only a mindful practice, but a heart heartful one. These are times when our hearts must lead. What do we truly love and can commit to activism? And can we commit to activism as a feat of love itself? An essential motivation in these times is the intent, practice, and expression of the Bodhisattva path. What does it mean to show up as a bodhisattva in deep service to the sacred web of life? And what internal narratives and fears keep us from speaking out and standing up? As we face wars, flooding, fire, and the old ghosts of fascism, I want to advocate for a deeper inquiry that enables honest conversations about the monsters living beneath this business as usual and what we want to do about them. So it's a real, a real call for us again to take the skills we have from the Dharma and to really put our whole, our collective um, hearts and minds to, um, to making substantial change, to think about what we what we are what we can do, and so it's um, you know, the beautiful bodhisattva path. Uh, um, it's um, a bodhisattva acts for the benefit of all, believing that all beings have Buddha nature, and all beings have the potential to to awaken. So our activism is an expression of this. Bodhisattva intention of, of living with compassion for all beings, of not throwing anyone out of our hearts, of really believing in, uh, well, as Sharon was saying, trusting in our own deepest experience. When we have a taste of liberation, get that little taste of liberation we can understand how important it is to offer that to, to others, to work with that, to let others have a taste of that. 
and that is really the way that we um, we in our, our organizing, in our activism, in our um, in our passionate defense of our planet, that we um, that we really um, come together at a time when uh, when there really is is a need to um, to take action to take our our great hearts and and act from them our our belief our our faith our trusting in our deepest experience and our deepest experience is really about care we care about this planet we care about each other we care about ourselves so the final um, author I want to share with you tonight is um, Joanna Macy and Joanna and, and Tanisra share. I mean, there are these pantheon of these you know, great um, Buddhist women teachers whom I just admire so tremendously. And Joanna Macy is um, kind of at the at the pinnacle. Um, Joanna is is 93 now and just is as, um, she served like Jane Goodall, when people say, you know, we well, are getting kind of up there and like Jane Goodall, Joanna says, yeah, I'm getting up there. I don't have a lot of time left. I really need to get to it. So it's, um, it's this great um, life affirming um, love with both Jane Goodall and, um, and Joanna Macy, it is this intense love and care for um, for our planet and its beings and each other. So this is from Joanna Macy's book, Active Hope. She says, the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, whom as most of you know, died earlier this year. Thich Nhat Hanh was once asked what we need to do to save our world. What we most need to do, he replied, is to hear within us the sounds of the earth crying. You read that again. When Thich Nhat Hanh was asked, what do we most need to do to save our world? He said, what we most need to do is to hear within us the sounds of the earth crying. Here's Joanna. The idea of the earth crying within us or through us doesn't make sense if we view ourselves only as separate individuals. Yet, if we think of ourselves deeply embedded on a larger web of life, as Gaia theory, Buddhism, and many other, especially indigenous spiritual traditions suggest, then the idea of the world feeling through us seems entirely natural. This view of the self is very different from the business as usual model. Its extreme individualism takes each of us as a separate bundle of self-interest with motivations and emotions that only make sense in the confines of our own stories. Pain for the world tells a different story, one about our interconnectedness. We feel distress when other beings suffer because at a deep level, we are not separate from them. The isolation that splits us from the living body of the world is an illusion. The pain, <coughs> the pain breaks through it to tell us who we really are. The isolation that splits us from the living body of the world is an illusion. The pain breaks through it to tell us who we really are. So if you remember when I read that quote from Sharon, where, you know, I personally feel so overwhelmed by everything that's going on, you know, what can I do? What can I make a difference? That is that disconnected self that small self, that 
ranting individual. What happens when we really allow ourselves to hear within ourselves the sound of the earth crying, it is really transformative. That sort of pain is really transformative. I think about it like a, almost the pain of giving birth to really acknowledge, to be that, that deeply within ourselves that we feel the pain of the, of the earth and that that intense pain shatters our illusion of separateness. And as Joanna says, it tells us who we really are. And some of you have heard me say this before that I think the most important thing about us as a species is that we are a caring species. That every single one of us here is only here because when we were infants, some individual or group of individuals cared enough about us to keep us alive. That, and that is, uh, and there are so many other um, beings on our planet that also are caring, uh, caring species. Maybe not in exactly the same way that human beings can be, but we, we notice, we see, um, we see caring in other, uh, at least uh, among many of our mammalian um, relatives. There is, is a lot of caring. We are essentially caring, caring beings. And that's a very different point of view than the sort of um, competitive survival of the fittest, you know, a, a whole other way of looking at evolution are, you know, what species have been able to adapt and to be symbiotic and be cooperative. Um, you know, we, we look through a different sort of lens. We look at the, the lens of interconnectedness and we see how amazing, how amazing that interconnectedness is. And it's our illusion of this separate self that really um, causes all this, this dysfunctional. When we are, are purely motivated by um, our sense of saving ourselves, protecting ourselves, and have this sort of, um, this kind of, of either withdrawal or this more aggressive or exploitative um, relationship to others. If our relationship to others is only transactional, there's very little joy in that. And so as we do this work, um, this work of having faith in action um, that are trusting our own deepest experience, if we can trust that experience of feeling so deeply, that sorrow, that pain for the earth. You know, sometimes um, I, I've, I've heard a number of um, naturalists say that one of the, the deepest sorrows that they have is that sense that future generations might never see some of the really beautiful things that have existed for many, many, many years on our on our, our planet. You know, that the glaciers will be gone. Yeah. That beautiful forests will be gone. That the coral reefs will all be bleached out. That sort of, of sorrow of, of the harm. And also that that feeling for the future, which is something that, you know, in many indigenous cultures, there is not only a real connection with the ancestors, but there is this real feeling of the importance of uh, taking care with and in and of creation so that it is there for future generations. That love of the future, the love of future generations 
and the, um, the care for it. And we know that everything is changing. We know that things are, are impermanent. It's not possible to um, to uh, somehow preserve what is always uh, what is always in some sense changing. But we do see a lot of damage, and we can really take that um, to heart and let ourselves be moved by it rather than being. Um, so defended against that um, that pain. I mean, Thich Nhat Hanh says that is the most important thing we can do is to let ourselves feel and to let ourselves know our interconnectedness. And this is the Dharma. This is a kind of mindfulness to let ourselves be be with that. So I'm going to um, open this up for discussion in a moment. I'm just going to end with uh, a poem by Joanna Macy that I come back to again and again because to me this is um, this is really uh, what I want to to trust as my my deepest experience. And Joanna says. When you act on behalf of something greater than yourself, you begin to feel it acting through you with a power that is greater than your own. This is grace. Today, as we take risks for the sake of something greater than our separate individual lives, we are feeling graced by other beings and by earth itself those with whom and on whose behalf we act give us strength give us eloquence and staying power we didn't know we had we just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other in the web of life our true power comes as a gift like grace, because in truth it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. I'm going to read the last two stanzas again. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other in this web of life. Our true power comes as a gift like grace because in truth it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strength of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. And I think that's faith in action. So I would be appreciative of any responses and um, comments or even questions that you, you might have. But I'd like to know how this lands for you. So feel free to unmute and, um, and to speak up. Well, I, I really appreciated it, Patrice. I liked you um, reading all those different, you know, um, authors because that was just inspirational for me. So, and also just, um, 
Yeah, it's just a lot to think about. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Marge. You're very welcome. Patrice, thank you for teaching tonight. I had to, I lost power here briefly in the Kingfield neighborhood and I think I missed about uh, 10 minutes or more of class. Um, and I'm out, now I'm on my iPhone because I don't have internet yet. But uh, a comment I have is, I recall when Shelley first started teaching this class, there were so many of us that had resistance to the word faith. And tonight, the class and then, you know, my, my uh, studying of the word and how, it, how it's involved when I move from being lost in thought to coming to the present moment, it has a different sort of meaning, meaning um, in, in the context of this practice um, now than it did, I don't know, a month or six weeks ago. So uh, I want to thank you and Shelley for continuing to address this term faith and how it's involved in the practice. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Chuck. You know, I mean, faith is, I think, a word that um, we needed to reclaim um, in, um, in Buddhist practice. And, and it's, uh, you know, people so often talk about faith as if it is just um, belief and, um, and sort of an unthinking belief or a naive belief. And um, this idea about, you know, faith sada in Pali, you know, to put, to place the heart upon that, that faith is, is a choice that we, um, we make in, in, um, in the, uh, it's an action, faith to, and actually, um, Sharon mentions that in sort of old English, faith, F-A-I-T-H-E, you know, I, I, faith my troth to something, you know, I pledge um, that, that faith was, um, you know, it's that kind of alignment with something. But what we find is that, you know, when we, we go to our own deepest experience and learn to trust that, to really trust that, that what we um, discover is, uh, you know, really beautiful Dharma. And that we discover that we're not, um, that our, our real experience is not this experience of um, isolation of this separate self. Um, and so uh, it's, um, it's a word that we um, we can reclaim and, and use, despite whatever sorts of bad religious experiences many of us um, had, or being chastised that we we didn't have have enough um, faith. Um, so, other comments. Hi. Hi, Jessica. And, 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 um, what's coming up for me, I think partly because of the storm and everything, there's something about this sort of like the story around, um, you know, how, like how the story of sort of like, um, you know, sort of the, our connection to the earth, our connection to Dhamma, and, and then the sort of how faith is sort of like in this place, but also in this sort of story of like what I was raised with, was traditional sort of like a Catholic religion 
there's all this sort of like um, energy around like camping, maybe getting somewhere, you know, like, and I know in our practice, we sort of are always in this, in this place where we are now. And, um, but so there's this pull for me, I think, in terms of like a faith where there's like, a, it's, it's something about a looking out where like, I'm not sure what I'm looking at <laughs> and, and like an, and a destination maybe, or a something that like, I don't know is there or coming, including, you know, whether or not the earth can be somehow healed as an organism or whether our, our bodies as part of that will be able to be healed, you know, really anymore either. You know, it sort of seems like there's a, I don't know, there's something about this, this sort of energy of a story that kind of wants, wants, wants to push me or pull me around some things. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure what to do about that, but it's like, I, mean, I just feel it really strongly now, partly because of this very, you know, stern and drama mm -hmm. thing of what's happening outside as well. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's really um, easy to be swept away by, uh, by narratives. And, you know, we, we love, and, and stories are, are a good thing. We often learn things by stories and, you know, we learn how other people live by, by stories and, and reading. So there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, narrative can be uh, really a wonderful thing what trips us up sometimes is if we need to know how something is going to end, uh, how something is, you know, can, can we just live with a kind of um, ambiguity? Um, you know, um, um, the Venerable uh, Analio, who is a, a wonderful scholar and teaches at um, the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies and has some very beautiful um, online teachings and meditations. Um, he said the way, he, and, and he's completely devoted to talking about the climate right now, climate issues. And he said the way he had to uh, approach that was to do a meditation a very deep meditation about total extinction and to be able to sit with that and be with that and to really take that in and, um, you know, and, and to really understand um, that as, uh, you know, a real possibility. So to completely take it in and then to do um, what he can. And I have thought sometimes that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, just as um, we would not abandon a person who is dying, if a person is dying, we would probably make our best efforts to be present, to comfort, to do whatever we could to, um, support that person um, to be there, to have extraordinary kindness. Um, and I think, well, if this is a dying planet, why wouldn't we treat that planet the same way? Do we only, uh, are we only going to, um, to act if we know there's gonna be a good, a good outcome or the odds are in favor of a good outcome? I we do. Go on. I, 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 oh, we finished. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that you know, we 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 do what we can to alleviate harm or to, um, you know, as Pascal said, you know, what leads towards suffering, what leads away from suffering. We do what we can because we're committed to. Um, to looking at suffering and the causes of suffering and I, as I, best I, we can eliminating them. Mm -hmm, Jessica? Yeah. Something, there's something that, like uh, whatever is coming up, there's sort of this idea of like, I think, I think what comes up for me oftentimes is like, there's this kind of way of like have, having been, I guess the way that we're parented or something like that, the way that, like there's something about like this, this feeling of being punished or like having done a bad thing and like, how do we sort of like, then like turn around and become these, these people that like aren't just like you know these kind of shamed 
beings for like having done this to the earth or something how do we like bring people around to sort of like having an empowered stance within their own, own selves a non-shame based kind of like you know this has happened but we you know I'm, there's something about that sort of i don't know wanting to hide from our own sort of like actions or wanting to having like does that make sense something like I don't know how to get around to it, but it, there's something there about that having a hard time with how that makes one feel and how to empower people outside of that way of being, you know, scolded or feeling badly about themselves. Or anything. Well, shame and guilt and feeling, um, you know, sort of uh, responsible. I mean, you know, that that, that is um, that is deeply encultured, and it makes us each of us feel more separate. And, you know, Sharon sort of mentioned that when we, we think, you know, what can I do? I can't make it, you know, it's all that, that kind of selfing that, that comes up. I think it is also in many ways um, kind of a feature of um, white culture in, in a way um, that, that sort of, you know, if you don't know how to fix, first of all, there are problems that we have to fix. Um, and that everything is, is sort of looked at in terms of a problem and how do we solve the problem. And problem solving is a wonderful paradigm, but it's not a paradigm for everything. It's, it's very different than say a paradigm of, of healing or there are other kinds of paradigms, but that is our, our dominant to, to understand everything as a problem that needs to be fixed. And if we can't solve the problem, there's something wrong with us as problem solvers. And that is, is really often just a real stopping point for a lot of people instead of approaching something as, as a caring person, what can I do? What do I need to understand to really be present here? What do I really need to let go of so I can really be open to how things are? It's Thich Nhat Hanh's, you know, what we the most important thing we could do is to hear the cries of the world inside us and that really goes against the dominant um, paradigm so it's no wonder that we feel some sort of distress or anxiety or jitteriness um, around us and um, and if you can't fix something the idea is you're incompetent you're bad um, and the superior people will be able to figure this out. It's like that idea that you know technology is going to to save us. Um, you know, sort of technological salvation. Technology is wonderful, but the technological mindset and the Buddhist author um, Stephen Batchelor often talks about this. Um, uh, talking actually with the making reference to the philosopher Heidegger about the technological frame of mind, which is a part of our, our whiteness. And when we can see that, then we're liberated in a way. It sort of goes back to what Pascal Eau Claire was saying. So there's um, a, lot, a lot in that for us to, um, to work with. So I, I hope that everyone is able to, um, to really feel the caring to, and to uh, trust yourself enough to allow yourself to feel, truly feel the cries of the earth inside you, that that, um, that is one of the ways that we will, um, we will be able to get out of our small selves and be together and uh, be kind and caring. So I'll end with sharing the merit because it's, a minute before nine. So as many of you know, this is my favorite act of imaginative Buddhism. So as we get to, we get to wish every, every being well. So if there is any benefit to our practice tonight, any goodness, any merit, any blessing, we would happily, joyfully, exuberantly share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would be happy to share any blessings with our teachers, our parents, our families, our friends, our community. 
we would share any any merit, any blessings with the people we like and also with the people we don't like so much. We would share our blessings with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two leggeds, we would share our blessings with the four leggeds, the many leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, the slithery, and the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So thank you all for your kind attention uh, this evening, and um, Shelley will be back next week. So take care. <laughs>